It took more than a thousand years for Buddhism to spread from the plains of India to the Himalayan snow peaks and then on to the Tibetan plateau. But once it had taken root, Buddhist values of non-violence, tolerance, and respect for the environment began to influence communities throughout Tibet. In Bhutan, high on the rock face of a mountain, there is a cave known as the Tiger's Nest. In the ninth century, Padmasambhava, the founder of Tibetan Buddhism, meditated there. For those that undertake the strenuous climb up to it, the journey symbolizes a path to a pure land, the ultimate goal being enlightenment. Buddhist teachings are profound ways of inner transformation. They are available to anyone possessing the courage and diligence to practice them. At the center of this world is the Lama, or spiritual teacher, a living example of enlightenment. As a spiritual leader, he also participated in every aspect of Tibetan culture. Lama was capable of inspiring and guiding others to realize the unshakable awareness of their own mind. One such teacher was Kensi Rinpoche. Dalai Lama was one of the many teachers who was inspired and taught by Kinsey Rinpoche. Uh, he was one of my uh, main gurus. Uh, and especially the Dzogchen teaching and also some other very rare uh, say oral transmission. Not only uh, the Nima tradition, but also Saja tradition, Giluk tradition, uh, and also Goju tradition, as I received from him. So I, uh, I consider uh, Lady Tenzer Buche as very, very, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, grateful, very, very helpful for my spiritual practice. When, when he uh, sit on chair or throne, uh, very, I'd say, very magnificent, uh, very impressive. His body appearance, very well, 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 I'd say, uh, uh, very well built. Uh, and he always smiled, always smiled. <laughs> The Dalai Lama requests teachings from Kensei Rinpoche, making a symbolic offering of precious stones as a symbol of the whole universe. Visualizations, ritual objects, and sometimes even costumes are used by the teacher to show the student a means of transforming his perception of the world and opening to his potentially enlightened state. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
At the end of this three-day empowerment, the roles are reversed, and as a sign of humility, Kensi Rinpoche requests the Dalai Lama to bless him. As a symbol of gratitude for the Guru's teachings, the Dalai Lama offers him a ceremonial white scarf called a kata and requests him to pray for Tibet. And, you say, uh, according to my own experience, of course, you say, as a result of meeting these great masters, is my special development, uh, I'm, for, for my special development, a great beneficial, great benefit. Buddhism was born in India 2,500 years ago when an Indian prince named Siddhartha left the wealth and comforts of his father's palace to find the meaning of life. After many years of meditation, he realized the ultimate nature of reality and became known as the Buddha, or the Awakened One. Padmasambhava is revered by Tibetans as the second Buddha. He was invited by the king of Tibet to establish Buddhism in the land of snows. His extraordinary power overcame all resistance, both human and supernatural, that he encountered on his journey to bring Buddhism to Tibet. Through the power of his realization, Tibet became a unique spiritual society whose traditions have remained unbroken until the recent occupation by the communist Chinese. Ironically, these tragic events were the catalyst for Tibetan teachers to bring their wisdom and experience to the rest of the world. Many people who met these great masters were struck by their kindness, sense of humor, and extraordinary presence, and began to learn that Buddhism was not based on withdrawing from the world, but on embracing it with love and compassion. That lasting happiness can only come from inner peace. Kensi Rinpoche was born in 1910 in eastern Tibet. At the age of 13, he felt a deep longing to pursue a spiritual life and go on a long meditative retreat. On leaving home, he wrote a letter to his parents. Father and mother, stay in your beautiful home. Your son longs instead for empty caves. A handbook of spirituality is all I wish to keep. Your smiling faces will be with me always. And if one day I might reach spiritual realization, I shall repay your great kindness to me. For the next 15 years, Kinsey Rinpoche meditated in many caves, often remaining snowbound for the entire winter. Of his main teacher, Session Gyalsap, he said, I was overwhelmed by the splendor of his expression when he would gaze at me and ask, what is the nature of mind? I felt that he was exactly the same as the Buddha, and I began to understand how to meditate. After many years of studying with his second teacher, Kensei Choki Lodro, he told him that he wished to spend the rest of his life in solitary retreat. But his teacher was adamant, the time has come for you to give others the precious teachings you have received. His first major teaching was given to 2,000 yogis in the province of Amdo, lasting for over six months. From then on, until the end of his life, Kensi Rinpoche never stopped teaching.
1949, China invaded Tibet. By the end of the 50s, the occupation was solidified. Sorrow and devastation tore through a thousand years of peace. A human and cultural genocide soon followed. The Dalai Lama, followed by a hundred thousand Tibetans, escaped to India. Six thousand monasteries were destroyed. One million Tibetans died. Kinsey Rinpoche wrote, A beautiful country is a dreamlike illusion. It's senseless to cling to it. Unless the inner forces of negative emotions are conquered, strife with outer enemies will never end. Fleeing from the invasion of his country, Kensi Rinpoche was invited to take refuge in the kingdom of Bhutan. This mountain kingdom has remained unconquered and independent ever since Buddhism was first introduced. Soon the power of his realization drew many students to him. As the years passed, he became the foremost teacher in Bhutan, revered by all, from the king and queen mother to the humblest farmer. He generously gave teachings and performed ceremonies, working to preserve peace and nurture Buddhist traditions in Bhutan. Shantideva, a 7th century Buddhist master, said, All the joy the world contains has come through wishing happiness for others. All the misery the world contains has come through wanting pleasure for oneself. Kensi Rinpoche's compassionate activities embraced not only the kingdom of Bhutan, but also Nepal, Sikkim, and India, and later extended to Europe and North America. It was near the great stupa of Bodhnath in Nepal that Kensi Rinpoche decided to build a large monastery, similar to the Session monastery that had been destroyed in Tibet. It took over 12 years to build. The site was consecrated in a ceremony attended by many young lamas. Even before the monastery was finished, it was part of the community's spiritual life. For several years, many artists and their families lived inside the half-built monastery, creating the thousands of traditional paintings, gold-covered sculptures, ceremonial masks and costumes that are used in the daily life of a Tibetan monastery. Today, Session Monastery offers one of the most authentic examples of these sacred arts outside of Tibet. Kensi Rinpoche's day began at four in the morning with meditation and prayers, which would last until nine o'clock. Then people would arrive to receive his teachings and blessings. It seemed that he was living many lives at the same time, whether writing one of his 25 volumes of commentaries, being in retreat, teaching scriptures, building monasteries, or providing for the spiritual needs of whoever appeared before him. His life was an endless offering to others. Kensi Rinpoche was always involved with the education of the young monks, often quoting to them the words of the Buddha. 
I have shown you the methods that lead to liberation, but you should know that liberation depends upon yourself. As if reading from an unseen book, Kinsi Rinpoche would teach effortlessly without pause or hesitation. He taught in every free moment of the day until late at night, responding to all requests for spiritual guidance. Their final enlightenment, uh, from the Buddhist viewpoint, of course, the Buddhahood is the uh, final enlightenment. They are the, uh, I think, uh, we can say that is the uh, ultimate nature of consciousness or mind. Uh, till you reach Buddhahood, uh, the study or uh, practice, no end. When Bud Buddha enlightenment, Buddha, or the enlightenment of Buddhahood comes, then uh, uh, you can get complete rest. There's no need effort. Till that, till that is eleven. Yes, constant effort need. <laughs> For the Tibetan Buddhist, each symbolic object gesture or chant is an offering representing an outer projection of an inner meditation. The ultimate goal is to realize the true nature of mind. At the end of nine days and nights of uninterrupted meditation, Participants in this ritual each hold a lamp symbolizing the light of wisdom. <laughs> Kensi Rinpoche's grandson and spiritual heir, Rabjam Rinpoche, leads the chant. They pray to relieve the sufferings of all beings and vow to be reborn and practice together in future lives. Every object in the ritual has an inner meaning. This five-petaled crown symbolizes the transformation of five harmful emotions, hatred, greed, ignorance, pride, and jealousy, into wisdom. In the fire ritual, the flames symbolize the wisdom that burns away ignorance and self-centered emotions. At the end of a large ceremony, the intricately created sand mandala is swept up and scattered into a river, a reminder of the impermanent nature of everything. In session, the sacred dances that had been forbidden in occupied Tibet were now revived.
During a two-day annual festival, the monks share with the entire lay community their inner spiritual experiences through these sacred dances. These symbolic movements are said to have the power to liberate the mind from disturbing emotions. Every year, Kensi Rinpoche, Rabjam Rinpoche, and his disciples would gather in India under the tree where the Buddha received enlightenment and offer prayers for world peace. Those with compassion are kind even when angry. Those without compassion kill even as they smile. By offering thousands of devotions a day, these monks pray to take upon themselves the sufferings of all beings and to send them happiness in return. All over the Himalayas, prayers are carried by the wind that blows over flags and by water turning prayer wheels. <laughs> Prayers are also carved in rock. As long as space endures, and as long as beings exist, may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. In 1985, after sealing the borders for decades, the Chinese allowed a few Tibetans to briefly visit their homeland. Among them was Kensi Rinpoche. For Tibet, the return of this great master after 30 years of exile was like a bright sunrise after a long night of darkness. <laughs> The Chinese persecution had not diminished the Tibetan people's strength of mind nor their love for their Buddhist traditions. The news of his arrival spread like wildfire. Crowds gathered to see his face and request his blessings. Despite his old age, Kensi Rinpoche visited every monastery that invited him. A few hours from Lhasa, he crossed the Sangpo River to Samye, Tibet's first monastery, built in the 9th century. Beholding the Chinese destruction of the beloved monastery, he vowed to restore it to its former splendor. Five years later, he returned to Tibet to reconsecrate a fully restored Samye monastery. <laughs> Wherever
Wherever Kensei Rinpoche went, the entire village would be waiting to see him and listen to his advice. After several days on the long road to eastern Tibet, 300 horsemen, wearing white hats as a sign of welcome, rode out to escort Kensi Rinpoche to his monastery. A traditional procession had formed to greet him at Derge and show him the only printing press in Tibet that was not destroyed during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. <laughs> Tibetans venerate books of scriptures that embody the Buddha's speech and contain the instructions through which enlightenment can be reached. The press is therefore no less sacred than the temple. The 200,000 hand-carved woodblocks of scriptures stored at the press are once again being used to print copies of the texts. quiet moment with an old friend who had not been able to escape the Chinese occupation. Special celebrations welcome the great master. It is here at Session that Kensi Rinpoche met his own teacher and received his first essential instructions. He greets a former attendant who had prayed for years not to die before seeing the great master again. The years of horrendous suffering have not diminished the Tibetan people's capacity for joy. For hours, people would file by Kensei Rinpoche and Rabjom Rinpoche, now the abbot of the monastery. Many had walked for days through the mountains to receive their blessings. Precious relics and other sacred objects hidden from the Chinese at great risk are brought out for the first time. Apart from the joy of seeing his homeland and lost friends again, Kensi Rinpoche had another mission to accomplish. 
It was to give teachings and initiations to other lamas and students, all of whom had been denied their spiritual heritage for so many years. The wide open expanse of spiritual realization, the true condition of mind, is like the sky, like space, without center, without edge, without goal, dissolving into the expanse of emptiness that has no limits and no boundary. Everything I see, everything I hear, my own mind and the sky all merge. When you see a lofty mountain, be reminded of the inner view. The view is the teacher's mind, inseparable from the nature of your own. Kensi Rinpoche had numerous visions of spiritual treasures. In one of these discoveries, he saw the mandala of the Buddha of eternal life appearing on the surface of a lake. Following this vision, he wrote a whole volume of teachings and spiritual practices. From the Buddhist viewpoint, real blessing must, uh, must come from within. So we are our own master. So even Buddha himself, you see, made very clear, uh, he, I mean, he, uh, he should consider as a teacher. Not, not a real protector. The real protector is Dharma. It's like medicine. Medicine, only medicine can cure uh, your illness. Not by doctor. Doctor prescribed the medicine and give you advice what should to do, what, what should avoid, what should do. Then if you follow the doctor's advice and take the medicine, uh, regularly, then illness uh, will, will disappear. At the heart of Tibetan Buddhism is the openness and confidence between student and teacher. Through this relationship, the student begins to recognize and develop trust in his or her own innate wisdom. Even a few words or a gesture from Kinsey Rinpoche could open the door to a whole succession of spiritual insights. Rabjan Rinpoche said of his grandfather, he would reply to our questions not only as a scholar, but from the depth of his practical experience and wisdom. His main concern was to help others, to be in his presence, was to experience a living example of what lies at the end of the spiritual path. Although the teacher appears to us in ordinary human form, in reality his mind is no different from the Buddha's. The only difference between the teacher and the Buddha lies in his kindness to you. The spiritual relation is not only one lifetime, but up to Buddhahood. So irrespective of what form of life, so that spiritual relations 
always remain there. So the uh, the relation on, on as a person, person to person, but of course, mainly for one life. Uh. <laughs> Rabjam Rinpoche is the incarnation of one of Kensi Rinpoche's own teachers. So their spiritual relationship continues from life to life. To his daughter and wife, Kensi Rinpoche was more than a loving father and husband. His love and compassion was the same for all beings. As he wrote, Spending your time with true spiritual friends will fill you with love for all beings and help you to see how negative attachments and hatred are. Being with such friends and following their example will naturally imbue you with their good qualities, just as all the birds flying around a golden mountain are bathed in its golden radiance. Nearing the end of his life, Kensi Rinpoche was particularly attentive to those young lamas who had been recognized as incarnations of past teachers. Now, each one will pass on the living lineage to yet another generation, like a flame spreading from one candle to many others. In the midst of clouds of impermanence and illusion dances the lightning of life. Can you say you won't die tomorrow? Practice the Dharma. After a short illness, Kensi Rinpoche died in Bhutan in 1991. 60,000 people, nearly one-tenth of the population of the whole country, gathered together for his cremation. The royal family, 100 teachers and countless students from all over the world gathered on all sides of the cremation stupa to meditate and offer prayers. While his physical body dissolves into the flames, his wisdom, inspiration, and very presence lives on in the hearts of all who met him. Once a week, for seven weeks, a hundred thousand butter lambs were offered at the great stupa in Nepal in his memory. Kenzhen uh, and also my late other teachers, the physical, as a human form, uh, no longer there, 
uh, we may find their reincarnation somewhere. Uh, but you see, to me, <laughs> more important thing is their spiritual energy. <laughs> so, of course, that reincarnation also is very important. But more important <laughs> is uh, the spiritual energy. They're always there. <laughs> Kinti Rinpoche's close friend and disciple, Trulshik Rinpoche, answered the prayers of the Dalai Lama and other teachers that an incarnation might swiftly appear by having dreams and visions clearly indicating where the young boy was to be found. So is I have full con uh, say, conviction is it this young uh, active is a boy <laughs> is true the reincarnation of the late Jesus Reincarnation for spiritual masters is due to taking a vow to have continuous rebirth to help others on their journey to enlightenment. As the reincarnation of Kensei Rinpoche, young Yangtze is to continue his sacred path. In the hills of eastern Nepal, in a sacred cave, Trulshig Rinpoche performed a ceremony for the young Kensi Rinpoche's long life and for his future activities and the benefit of others. must is implement this teaching in daily life uh, so that we will be a, a good disciple of good lama so that is about my guru <laughs>